Welcome to The Exchange with KB with your host, Kirill Bensonoff. Kirill talks to innovators and business leaders who share interesting stories of their success, overcoming challenges, and actionable advice you can learn from. Visit kirillbensonoff.com and sign up for updates. Joining KB today is Marguerite de Crissel, CEO of Blockade Games, creators of the upcoming blockchain cyberpunk RPG Neon District. Marguerite is credited with creating the new genre now known as crypto puzzles, for which she received international publicity, has built numerous cryptocurrency communities, and launched Blockade Games, a blockchain game studio with multiple releases. Now, here's your host, KB. Hey, Marguerite, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Why don't we start off, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your background. I've been in the blockchain space since about 2013. I was a fine artist and getting into creative technology. And then I started mining Bitcoin and Litecoin and some other script coins about that time um, and became really interested in the idea of distributed ledgers and decentralized technology. So I started to try to understand it better through my own creative process. So I started making art pieces that used and, and interactive experiences that use blockchain technology almost as an educational experience. And um, from there, I built up a team of artists and programmers, and we started making more elaborate interactive experiences until we eventually launched a game studio in January 2018 called Blockade Games, which now consists of about 25 people, including veteran game industry folks and blockchain engineers and very amazing fine artists. Yeah, this is awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited to be talking to you today because you're, you're unlike, uh, you know, most other people I've talked to in the space. I mean, you, you really kind of combine a lot of different things and, and, and I'm so interested to ask you a ton of questions. But I want to start out by just kind of learning about how you first found out about Bitcoin or blockchain. Can you remember that moment? Yep. Uh, so it was a family holiday and someone in the family was um, going to do like a, a wire transfer to get Bitcoin, their first Bitcoin. And I think it was maybe 2012. I can't mm-hmm. totally remember which year it was, but I remember thinking like, what are you buying? What is the <laughs> thing that, I mean, cause I've been around um, when eBay, people would do wire transfers to eBay, eBay and get scammed. I've seen that happen to friends. And so it just felt like another one of those things. And, um, and then they were in place in return getting digital money. My first thought was how could that possibly be valuable? Like how could you have this thing that someone just made up and said, this is a valuable asset on the computer, right? Like it it took me a minute to wrap my head around that. So our family has a computer scientist in my family. So it was a conversation that would come up and I would halfway listen for that first year um, to what people were talking about. I kind of wrote it off. And then when we started setting up the mining rigs, that's when I really became interested. I liked computers, I was a gamer. And I liked graphics cards and, um, and building computers. So then when we were using these same computers to mine what was oppo- supposedly something valuable and was trading um, at, for a few dollars at the time, I was interested in what was going on and how it was secure. I remember listening to Andreas Antonopoulos. I think um, I downloaded, I was looking for podcasts online and Let's Talk Bitcoin was one of the ones that popped up. So I started listening to that. Andreas Antonopoulos was a host on there and I loved how he spoke about it. So then I went down the rabbit hole of digging up everything Andreas Antonopoulos had to talk about in regards to Bitcoin and his own YouTube channels. Um, And that was my, I'd say my onboarding. After that, I think I started making portraits for Bitcoin Magazine at the time. They Mm -hmm. were just, they weren't paying much uh, for artists, but they were just looking for people that were willing to help out. And so I was trying to build up my own brand. And and then I I made a piece about Andreas, I think a portrait that had numbers around it. And it was after that, that when I made my next piece, that was about the dark wallet, which was a a wallet that was supposed to make Bitcoin private um, as it went in and out of your wallet. And it was being developed by Amir Takai and Cody Wilson. So that next step was when I started thinking about, oh, I could could put Bitcoin directly because I had done the numbers on the art piece for Andreas's portrait. So this next portrait, I started thinking about how I could actually make like a pattern that was meaningful in numbers and how that could maybe be a Bitcoin private key. So that was when I started combining, I guess, the two together. It wasn't really interactive yet, but it was definitely thinking about how Bitcoin transcends, it transcends the digital uh, space in the fact that it has value both in the digital and physical world. 
Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting because you, you kind of started thinking about Bitcoin, I, I guess, differently than most other people. I mean, did you ever, did you ever did you think about Bitcoin as just, you know, a, a store of value or like a, something you could trade or invest? I mean, did you ever think of it that way? or? Yeah, no, I mean, I was thinking it uh, in its, uh, that it's a unit of value, but I, I guess I was thinking about how it was really weird that math was valuable. Right. <laughs> like, and and then in thinking that okay, math is valuable, which kind of made sense because it's more, it's it's almost like more concrete than what we call the money today, like fiat, uh, which isn't really backed by anything. The fact that it's something backed by provable was interesting. So then, if you take that, I mean, you can do all kinds of fun things with math. Yeah. So that I think that was like my moment of. Oh wow! This could be a this could be a real thing, and really uh, tap into the like the creatives, which I think we're seeing now today. Uh, over the years, creatives have started to embrace it and do all kinds of funky things with it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I, did you and and do you consider yourself? I mean, you've been into art. I was reading some of your background. I mean, you've had uh, sort of I, I guess marketing type of positions and art you know, positions, I mean, do you consider yourself an artist, a marketer, a combination or something else? Well, so I, um, honestly, like I came into the space just directly thinking, okay, um, what can I do to help or contribute? And the open source community, I'd never participated in an open source community before. I didn't realize that you could just walk into a project, contribute, earn a reputation, and then people would come to you um, or you'd work with other people. So my experience with Bitcoin was I started to become a community builder and I didn't really intend to do that. I just was trying to contribute because I thought it was interesting. And then from there, there were these other projects that became interesting to me. I got into Decred um, in 2016. I thought that I was watching their GitHub and it was really active, but their developers were super quiet. And I remember myself and some other community people that largely were a part of the Bitcoin community, but we had other side projects that we were interested in too. We were talking about Decred and we were saying, man, this project looks really promising, but there's, they're so quiet. And so the community kind of built up around Decred and wanted to figure out how they could support these developers that were just working quietly behind the scenes. What, what's, uh, sorry, for the listeners out there, what, can you talk a bit about Decred, what they do? Sure, it's, um, it's, a, it's like Bitcoin in some um, sense, except they're a hybrid proof of stake, proof of work. They are focused on governance, so at, at the protocol level, at the consensus layer, sorry. So when um, there's a decision to be made, the community can vote on it, and then the developers will work on it. And then it will be pushed directly to like merged on chain. Uh, once the developers have built it, uh, it'll be merged via the community's approval. Mm -hmm. So everything's very transparent. There's, I mean, there's things that are hard and just not perfect. Like it's, it's really hard to build up a system where it's fair across the different holders. And then you have to define like what is fair and what makes it what, like if you have a bunch of whales holding all the coin, you, like there's just a conversation around is that is that how you want to build a network or is there a better way to do it so now we've seen a lot of different uh, conversations like quadratic voting i don't know if you've been paying attention like vitalik has talked a little bit about that but i think governance and voting is just the thing that we're all going to be working on in the next you know how like forever i think mm -hmm. governance is just a hard problem and, and and so you you were basically like the community or the marketing lead for decred yeah, I was community, um, community, uh, a community manager, and I was head of marketing for about a year and a half. Um, uh -huh. And I used the puzzles and the cryptographic art puzzles, those interactive educational experiences um, for about for that whole period of time. And we built up a very intelligent, creative community using that tool. It's basically, I mean, if you think of like the CIA, which uses fun cryptographic puzzle challenges to recruit talent. It's kind of similar, and I mean, that was more of a retrospective realization, was these challenges really attract a certain type of individual, somebody that has work ethic, time, talent, and creativity. And uh, recruiting those types of people made for a very strong, committed uh, background, so, or community. So anyways, um, 
Yeah, I love the decred community. They really do so much uh, just on their own. And I think we see that a lot in this space when you have projects with integrity and great open source communities, they they can do so much. I think that it's a something that stands out in contrast to a lot of the ICO projects that when you just create a whole bunch of bag holders, um, it becomes a big burden on the developers as opposed to trying to do something more with a fair launch. Do, do you think that though, like the human greed will sort of hinder this quote unquote, you know, I, idealistic or perfect community development or is, or do you believe that that's still possible? I think that um, there's a challenge, a real challenge when you have coins that are promising to be a unit of value, right? So we, a lot of these conversations, these are projects all trying to build some sort of monetary unit. I think the way in which they launch determines the promise and the health of their community. And I do think that greed and um, toxicity is a big challenge for any of these projects. But I think that we're mer like moving into a DAP, like uh, with DAPs and application developers, we're really starting to see that happen now. I think the space has been around long enough. Layer 2 technology is really starting to take off on some of these different networks. So actual use cases for uh, the networks is going to maybe shift that and build healthier communities. Uh, it, like if you see Cosmos, a Loom network, Thematic network, uh, there's, there's different projects that are all about like use cases and actual applications. So I think that is providing a, diff a more dynamic community building. But yeah, you know, uh, toxic communities is a real problem. And you just get a lot of noisy people that don't want to lift their fingers, uh, but they just want the development team. Well, and it's, that you have to look at the launch of the coin. Like if you have developers that were greedy from the start or like didn't, weren't smart in their decision making and how they launched the network, that's going to basically show you the intent, like it's poor tell the healthier community. Yeah. And I think that that's probably generally, I mean, that's that, I guess that's the reason why we have regulations and stuff like that around securities, because obviously there is quite a number of people that will expect others to kind of put in the effort and then they expect to reap some, some reward from, from something that, they, you know, maybe something small they did in the beginning. So, so I, I think that that certainly permeates a lot of projects and, and a lot of other areas of life as well. So let's talk about Blockade Games. How did you first come up with the idea? Were you thinking about it while you were at Decred? How did you start this whole thing? That's kind of going back to like, how do you start a project? How do you start something in a healthy way? We, I did what I could with what my own skills and talents um, from day one. And then by doing that, I started attracting other like-minded people that then wanted to join forces with me. And then so then when I got into Decred, uh, they were recognizing that talent and ability and started funding that work. And then uh, and more talent joined. So we scaled organically and very naturally over time, you know, sort of the past six years, basically. And so then when we launched Blockade in 2018, we had built a reputation and enough talent that we could have a very legitimate company with a lot of promise. So moving into blockade in the next chapter of what we wanted to do, uh, we took a little bit of a leap going from the gamified experiences that we were shipping. We were building them in a month. They'd have about a three month lifespan to wanting to do something bigger. So all of that before had been for educational purposes and marketing purposes. And then we decided when crypto kitties launched, we saw the, the, power basically of the non-fungible asset and how that was a perfect fit for what we were doing in gaming and also an opportunity to give participants the ability to walk away with something to commensurate their experience with their that gaming that they were doing with the blockchain application so that was where we said okay now let's take this idea and really explore it and how would we build and design a game around this to, to create value for a long tail experience um, and for content creation. And that's where we launched the platform that we're building with Blockade and then also the game design. And we've been building those um, simultaneously side by side for the past two years. So, so you have a game, uh, is it out already in Neon District or is it, uh, what's yeah. the status? Okay. Yeah, Neon District is in pre-alpha pre at the moment. Okay. So we had what was called a founder's sale where we identified our top 1,000 founders. We made this um, basically a funnel to get down to our, our whales and our biggest social influencers, just our hardcore community members. And um, we set them apart. We gave them founders assets 
and um, what's called Founders Keys, which gave them access to these pre-alpha builds of Neon District, which is earlier access than you may see with a general game studio and what they would allow people to participate with. And rolling them into a private Founders Forum, which is where we ask them directly for feedback on different topics. We ask them for input. And then they are working with us basically side by side as we develop the game. The alpha for season one, which is the campaign for this, it's a cyberpunk RPG. That's slated for December 2nd, which is Cyber Monday of this year. That will be basically the biggest launch for us. It'll be public. It'll be a public launch. We'll have a public sale around it um, for the different assets, the game assets. But it's a free-to-play model. So you could just wait for the the game to launch and and play the game and accumulate these non-fungible assets, which just think of them like game assets uh, on this gaming platform. So yeah, I guess Blockade's purpose has been to abstract away the the user, the bad blockchain user experience and make it feel like a regular game. So you could just be a mainstream gamer, walk in and have no idea that these are blockchain assets. But then once you've been playing long enough, you get these notifications that introduce you to the peer to peer marketplace and kind of walk, like holds your hand as it shows you that maybe you have something valuable and maybe you could earn your first Ethereum or other uh, crypto asset. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, because th- this is the crux of it in, in my mind. I mean, when I met you earlier, and I, ha- I have to disclose I'm an investor in blockchain, uh, blockchain games. Uh, so w- when we met earlier, I mean, this was what kind of blew me away is that, A, you're sort of abstracting the blockchain for people who really don't know how to use it, which is like the vast majority of people out there today. Hopefully, they'll change, but th- that's what it is today. And then and then the whole idea of the NFT, the non-fungible token, which is like, a, I think, a, a, a paradigm shift in in the way that, you know, games and, and game objects uh, can be designed, played, and, and monetized. Do you think that this is the future of, of gaming in general, the NFT? Well, I think that it's definitely going to be a future of gaming. You know, gaming is very strong right now, the game industry, and it's projected to grow even at the current pace, 11% every year. And so looking at the esports gaming industry, it's already 454 active participants. Um, or 54 million, sorry, active participants, which is, I mean, that's bigger than America, you know? <laughs> it's really big. And we, and we just had in New York City um, a tournament with, um, what was the Fortnite tournament, where they gave away something like 30, was that $30 million for, um, across multiple different winners that uh, across different categories for Fortnite? I mean, like, it's just, it is a thriving industry. So I think blockchain gaming is going to be an aspect of that larger industry. And when we think about the collectible market, it's a $200 billion market. And I think that it, uh, the gaming industry is like 80 billion, something like that. So when you, when you merge those together, um, there's just, it's going to tap into different types of users, maybe users that want to collect and don't want to play. Like the, if you think of comic cons and how many people just go and want to collect these different um, collectibles that they cherish, but not necessarily like be a hardcore gamer. So you'll have a little bit of crossover between these different types of, of player types. And yeah, and I just want to explain real quick and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this, but the NFT for people who don't know what, what it is, is a, is a non-fungible token. So it's basically a unique token on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, is, that, is that somewhat correct? Yeah, and it's not just Ethereum. It's more of a classification that, like, if you think of Bitcoin like gold, and any unit of Bitcoin is going to be equivalent to any other unit of Bitcoin. Um, think about a non-fungible token as a, it could be considered like a diamond, where it has different traits, attributes, characteristics, and which it's classified by. And then that is um, usually compared to a certain valuation, given a valuation. Um, so you could, but it's definitely market driven whatever that valuation is it's it's more uh, speculative than it is uh like that you can it's definite if that makes sense and you could trade like a diamond for uh another diamond but they're not these two things are not the same yeah and so so each one is unique and then there is now secondary markets like OpenSea and probably others that uh you know that allow trading or selling these is that right yes that's right and the these uh, these uh, what's interesting with for example an OpenSea is we're starting to see, I don't know if you saw the Formula One auctions that happened recently, but you have major brands that are now, um, you're like I guess collectibles that are tied to major brands. 
and they're auctioning, I think the highest one was 415 ETH for a race car. And the game hasn't even launched yet. But um, not only them, but Deadpool has created some collectible assets. And these don't even, they're not even tied to a game. They're just purely digital collectible assets that are selling and trading. There were comic books where if you buy the token, then you have access to the PDF. And then there were, uh, there's, yeah, there's Marvel. A basketball, there's yeah. a basketball game I read about Top Shot, I think, NBA Top Shot. Yep. Uh, that's, that's, isn't that Crypto Kitties? Uh, Dapper Labs? Uh, it could be, yeah, it could be. So people, like mainstream industries are looking at this. I just was having conversations with Upper Deck when I was in San Diego last week, which is, if for people that don't know, it's a famous like um, game or game studio, but card uh, trading card game company, they're interested in what, cause they've already designed systems for this kind of value proposition, but it doesn't have the, what the blockchain introduces is the ability for it, these assets to leave their servers, which to them is very interesting and they want to explore it. And so we've had a few different conversations. I know the OpenSea guys have been talking to them too. So, I mean, that's like, it's going to be gigantic The if when the collectible space really starts to get into blockchain and it's going to bring lift, you know, it's a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. Do you think that the NFT in general changes the paradigm either for developers, for companies that develop games, you know, developers themselves, in terms of how they can monetize their uh, intellectual property and their, their skills and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. So there's things like you can add, you can add renting, um, which is something we've done at Blockade. Our season zero boss, somebody bought it for, it sold for $25,000. That's the, basically the boss of the tutorial level. Um, and what now he was a game developer. So what he's done is he's building and designing for other experiences with this celebrity asset outside of our game. And then he'll put it up for rent so that any community member can basically rent and experience what it's like to be the boss for a certain period of time, be it a few hours a day or whatnot, and play it in these different universes. And, and like that is a whole new way to monetize. Um, user generated content is something that we're developing for. So if someone is a famous artist and we want to introduce them as a guest artist to a certain limited edition of assets, I mean, that's a way for users to be able to, I guess, monetize themselves in, in, in a way that they haven't before. With Being able to tokenize content provides a lot of opportunity for, I guess, growing the ecosystem in that way. Once you've developed a core community, core gameplay, and then uh, ecosystem, it's really easy to allow others to engage and participate and build off of that. So, so like in the not so distant future, we can have somebody who's a gamer, you know, they're playing this game and, and, and the reward could be some kind of a unique, you know, an, an NFT, a unique token that they earn for doing whatever it is they do in game. And then they could take that token and either keep it or they could say, you know, I want to go on the secondary market, sell it for, for Ether or for whatever other cryptocurrency. And then at the end, you know, let's say they live in the U.S., exchange it for U.S. dollars. And then now they've kind of, they've, they've actually are back to fiat currency and they've, you know, they've earned money by playing a game, right? Is that, is that kind of the, the idea? Yep. That's the vision. The thing that's hard about that is creating a game that can have value over a long period of time and also to prevent a pay to win or pay to play model. So if you really want to have a free to play experience where it feels like skill definitely plays into the value proposition of the assets you have and it has an open market open economy such as like a blockchain game a uh, game would you have to really design in a specific way and so that's something that's why it took us so long for our game design we had to find expert game designers from basically trading card game experience backgrounds um our game design designers had worked on a world of warcraft trading card game which became the world uh hearthstone and, and they worked directly with richard garfield and like with these collectible assets that so they understand where things can fall apart um that's not something that we as uh, artists or, or blockchain engineers can you know know oh just from reading that's something that you really ha need to have experience in in, in that sort of industry. So yeah, I guess like what you were saying, the value, the asset being able to walk away with something valuable, that's definitely the vision. And then in our founder sale, for example, those 1000 participants, they saw a 2,500% ROI on the secondary market. So when they 
bought those assets from us for $5 or $10, they were able to turn around and sell that for a 2,500% ROI on average. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. So they're able to help you guys in essence to get off the ground by giving you kind of early funding and they, you know, they made out, uh, as far as their own profit, they made, you know, a nice markup and, uh, and it all happened fairly quickly. I would, I would imagine. Right. Right. Well, and that's how you really make, um, a healthy community from the beginning is don't make people bag holders, right? Don't make them holding your bill. Our users were able to like put in that investment, the amount investment they did. We made about $120,000, but then that market cap immediately turned into a $3.2 million market cap. Wow. That's, that's insane. I mean, I, if you compare that to like, you know, angel investments or VC investments, I mean, that's really in terms of time, right? I mean, obviously been great exits for angels and VCs and so forth, and, and there will continue to be, but I think this is like the a really, really early stage investing and it's, and it's, it has its own risks, I'm sure. Uh, but, but also, you know, this, this is great. It's great to see that, you know, you could build that kind of a community and, and it's helping you guys, uh, and it's helping you guys continue on. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, and it, like, that's something that um, I'm also hearing from investors and funds is they're looking, you know how investors love liquidity, especially in the blockchain space. Um, meaning that when they make an investment, they love it to be tradable as soon as, as fast as possible and, or to exit as fast as possible uh, with, with an ROI. Uh, they, they're they looking at non-fungible assets in the same way. Uh, so research is being done that not, non-fungible tokens are a great investment. Um, to make at least across the board with non-fungible tokens a 10x on on that secondary sale. Yeah, totally. And, and I just took a quick look at uh, OpenSea, and I haven't really been keeping track of what's going on there, but it looks like they, they certainly have a, a lot of different assets listed, and it looks like uh, a number of them have decent, you know, decent trading volume. So um, so hopefully market is continuing to grow. Um, and, and, and as far as like, you know, the blockchain, I mean, obviously we wouldn't have the NFT, we wouldn't be having this conversation potentially if it wasn't for the blockchain. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of challenges I'm sure associated. I mean, you mentioned game design, you know, I don't know if UI, UX or backend, but what's kind of, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, with building on top of blockchains? So um, one, so I guess something that uh, has been driving a lot of our decisions is user experience. So we really look at what there's a, there's some layer two technologies that exist right now for people that want to build applications on blockchain, but you really have to consider what does it put on the user? Does it require them to interact with a fungible token? Because if it does, that means that they now have to have prior blockchain knowledge. If they don't have to interact with the fungible token, that means that you can on like introduce that later. So just like with anything, you don't want to put a paywall on any application if you don't have to or put a, an educational barrier to entry. You always want to be able to onboard slowly into those areas. That's one of the biggest challenges is being able to find the right fit that doesn't compromise on security, that still gives all the best blockchain features, but doesn't put too much work on the user, which usually means the developers have to do a ton extra UX support and handle a lot of those experiences on the back end. There's a lot of way to build around things, but you'll see today pretty much everybody just, they see a ton of low hanging fruit. So they're just launching on main networks. Um, like if you look at EOS Knights, EOS Knights has taken off on EOS, but they've also made like Ethereum Knights, Clayton Knights, and they're launching directly on all these different public networks to for that user acquisition play. Um, because all these different chains are waiting for applications and they see that they could just acquire those users by launching directly on the platform. But that means that all your users are going to have to have that knowledge and skill set, as opposed to doing like a layer two application that's more blockchain agnostic that will have bridges or gateways to all these other public networks. I don't know yet which is going to be the better play long term. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, obviously, I believe that building agnostically or in a more user-friendly way will have the bigger, larger impact. It's just going to be a matter of um, like, will we be able to still attract all of those users to us if, if we're not directly already on one of these networks that has all the users waiting for applications to be built? Are, and is that how you guys are building as far as being blockchain agnostic or are you tied to a specific blockchain? 
Currently, um, so we're building with the Loom Network SDK, but Loom is providing su support for multiple different uh, gateways, and we are building our own gateways as well. So we're not using a Loom chain necessarily that they're providing. We're using like their tool set. We're running our own blockchain and then providing uh, transfer gateways to different public networks. So uh, our current parent chain is Ethereum, but they also have partnerships with Cosmos and Binance. Um, and I think they're providing support for EOS in the near future. EOS, you know, will require a little bit of extra work, but, um, but yeah, so we're, our play is to be blockchain agnostic so that we can be attractive to mainstream gamers and they don't need to know anything. And then once they decide which network or crypto they like the best, they have that opportunity to settle in that payment layer. Gotcha. That's really interesting. Do you think there's going to be, as far as the blockchains go, I mean, Ethereum is probably the most widely used uh, for dApps. Uh, and then there's there's obviously a, a lot of others with different use cases. But do you think there's going to be sort of winners and losers and, and there's going to be one you know, one standard, quote unquote, uh, in, in some number of years that people will kind of standardize on for a specific use case? Or do you think there's going to be that, that you know, uh, layer in between that will kind of make, abstract it all away and make it easy to work with multiple chains? So that's what we're doing at Blockade, is to build a platform that abstracts that all away, makes it really easy. And then it's just, it's basically a portal to the crypto ecosystem. So for us, we've taken a little bit more of a centralized approach with decentralization as a part of the onboarding experience. So you become more decentralized as you build more valuable assets and you want to be the sole owner of those. You'll, be, you'll have the opportunity, but you don't have to do it. And you don't even have to realize that you don't even have to realize basically the blockchain assets. You could just play the game and enjoy it. And that's still part of the, um, because people play games all the time just for fun. So you don't want to, like a game should still be made in a way that it's definitely for fun and is not only because you're speculating on the assets. I think that's going to be the way that it works in the future is I think these types of platforms that are made for the users and then with the strong networks in the background that are providing the secured payment systems and for the settlement layer. But I could be wrong. Maybe there's somebody that builds such a layer one network that can provide that same user experience in the future. I just, I'm not, it's hard to see it happening right now, especially since everybody requires like the fungible token to interact with the, the networks. Sure. Makes sense. All right. So, so what, what are you focused on next? What, what's going on at blockade? What are you focused on these days? Well, I don't, did you see that we just uh, rolled out a Lightning Network integration with Ethereum smart contracts? I have not seen that yet. Yeah, why don't you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so we did that um, last week, and Vitalik gave us some nice props on social media. I and, did see um, that. I did see yeah. that, actually, yeah. <laughs> so that, was, that was awesome and um, unexpected, but what we're doing is we're rolling out next week a game called Ledger of Zabo, which uses that technology um, so what it does is it's, it has a Bitcoin prize in the game, but you have to play and solve these different puzzles. Um, it's a, it's a legend of Zelda style game, eight bit game. And as you interact with the game, you'll be minting non fungible tokens, uh, which will be basically sprites, rare, different types of rarities of sprites that will be collectible assets. Um, but it also will allow you to buy lives. So it, it is purposely a pay to play model, but that's to prevent botting so that you'll be making little microtransactions as you're playing. Um, if you want to buy more lives because you, you know, you died so many times and you still want to try to get the grand prize. That's a part of the game. Um, and that's a way for us to monetize, but it's also a really cool way to think about this. So the, and it's basically that background I had with puzzle making and, um, it's, it's a little just next level using blockchain technology for that experience. So we are definitely targeting crypto users at that point. And just seeing how successful this integration with the, between the Lightning Network and the Ethereum um, smart contracts are, we were it was something we really just wanted to do because we knew it was possible. And there's a lot of creative things we can do with that crossover. Nice. And, and Neon District, is that still in development, you said? And, and is there, uh, and you mentioned a, a go live date, was it towards the end of the year or early next? Yeah, so uh, Neon, So basically our core development team is on Neon District. What's how Ledger of Zabo, for example, was developed by our R&D team and mm -hmm. community. 
Um, so that's one of the strengths of positives of having a very strong community is they want to build stuff for you alongside you. Whereas our core group with Neon District is just heads down all on that, not distracted at all. And that, you know, we just were in San Diego last week on season one, um, basically the, the roadmap and all the different pipelines. So for anyone that's ever made a game and, or anyone that hasn't, it's incredibly complicated. You have like a million different pipelines that are simultaneously need to coordinate their milestones and then everything. So everyone's developing and then it gets brought together and then it bridges out again. Everyone's developing and gets brought together. And this is just like, it's constant. So if you want to meet your release dates, it takes some incredible coordination or oversight to make sure that things are shipped. It is a lot of work and I know you have a great team behind you. That's, that's really exciting stuff. I mean, this is super interesting to learn. I, I, I used to be a gamer a long, long time ago, but I, I haven't been one in a long time, but this is fascinating stuff. Uh, so yeah, I'd, I'd love to uh, go through the lightning round with you. Are you ready? Okay. Awesome. So best NFT use case or use cases? Well, I really like our founder's keys. Um, I'm biased, obviously, but our founder's keys are neat because they kind of introduce a governance mechanism and that anyone that has a founder's key in their wallet can participate in voting. We basically look for that token in your wallet. It's tied to a reputation system. It has gems. So the more gems you have, it unlocks levels for a neon district and then um, gives you exclusive access and airdrops and as well as, like I said, that governance piece. So awesome. yeah, I like that. I guess. Cool. Uh, price of Bitcoin on December 31. Complete guess here. I think that Bitcoin is going to be breaking out in December. So I'm just going to go ahead and say 25,000. Awesome. We we're hoping to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite crypto fo focused author or publication? That's easy. Um, so Andreas Antonopoulos, for sure. I think he's such a great communicator. Cool. Your role model or hero? Uh, JK Rowling. Actually, I think that she, um, so she was a single mom that kind of built an empire on the things that she loved, which was just telling her kids stories. And she was able to capture that and package it up and something to be shared with the world. Yeah, she's, she's, she's done amazing, amazing stuff. I agree. Uh, last question. Most important developing in the gaming industry in the past 10 years? Man, that's really a tough one. The most important <laughs> in the game industry in the past 10 years. I know it's really gaming. broad. <laughs> well, mobile gaming, mo the free to play monetization. Uh, so free to play was like a, a new pillar in gaming that everybody ha had to redesign their gaming experiences for it. It used to be you pay to play, you know, download the game and play and then free to play and mobile gaming just like totally tore that industry apart. And people had to think about microtransactions and that sort of monetization. Um, so I'm trying to think of the first, was, I mean, was it Zynga that really broke out? Or I can't remember. Yeah, they're I mean, one of the first. But yeah. Super, that, that, super, super sell. Okay, yeah, one of them really uh, just blew the industry apart and made us realize that we could do gaming in different ways. And so I think that actually, though, shows us the potential with what we're doing right now with blockchain gaming and um asset ownership cool marguerite it's been fascinating talking to you i mean for everyone out there check out coin artists on twitter blockade games we're going to put up all the links on the website and it's been it's been really insightful thank you yeah thank you very much bye-bye